Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Neurology Lecture Series. Today, uh, the topic is Approach to Cognitive Impairment and Bedside Testing of Cognitive Functions. We have uh, Dr. Prabhagar here, who's a professor in Department of Neurological Sciences in CMC Bangalore. If you have any questions, please, uh, we have uh, uh, time at the end of the session to ask, or you can uh, end it in the chat, chat box. Over to you, sir. So very good afternoon to all of you. So uh, today we'll be looking at uh, how to test uh, cognitive function and I'll also be giving you a, a clinical approach to cognitive impairment uh, in the OPD setting as well as in the IP setting. But, uh, so I'll, uh, so I, at some point in life, all of you would have wondered, uh, where am I going? What am I doing? And what is the meaning of life? Uh, so if uh, you're able to do that, that means you have a fully functional mind and uh, that mind is because uh, there is a functioning brain underneath that that is producing the mind. And uh, so let's ask by starting, what is the function of uh, having a mind? So any guesses? So simplistic way of looking at it is that uh, the mind helps you survive in day-to-day -day life. So it gives you memory from which you can learn from the past. Uh, it helps you to deal with the problems of uh, everyday life. And it helps you to predict the future and uh, look towards tomorrow with hope. So that is the purpose of uh, having a mind and, and underlying that is the brain which uh, drives all of this uh, function of the mind. So let's start with some uh, interesting questions. So, so here is a creature uh, that is uh, displayed here. So I want you to guess whether it's a plant or an animal. So, so it does look like a plant, it looks like a flower and it, uh, so, but actually it's an animal. Uh, and uh, and this is actually called as a sea squirt. So even though it look it's uh, lives at the bottom of the ocean. So if you look at it, uh, the morphology of it looks very much like a plant. In fact, it looks like a flower. And life cycle, you see, you'll understand why it's an animal. So if you're wondering why I'm showing this creature, let's uh, I'll let you know. So 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 this is a life cycle of the sea squirt. Uh, so uh, it is uh, it starts off as uh, a larval stage. Uh, it looks very much like a. It looks very much like a tadpole. Uh, it's a free living life form. It swims around in the ocean. Uh, it actively looks for food. So because it actively looks for food, it needs to perceive things in and around it. So it has a brain to perceive. It's got eyes, and uh, it moves around. Uh, it escapes from predators, and then finally it becomes the adult life form. So, so and if you see the adult life form as it settles down in life, like a lot of us human beings. Uh, starts slowly losing its brain. So it no longer has to fight for food. All uh, food that uh, drops down from to the ocean floor from above is picked up by the adult uh, sea squirt. So it doesn't have to move. Hence, it doesn't have to perceive the world around it. And hence, uh, the brain it had as a larval stage gets completely digested. Uh, so this uh, is a classic example of uh, one of the primary purposes having a nervous system or having a brain uh, is uh, for locomotion. So, and why do animals have to locomote? Uh, unlike plants, is that animals do not have a source. Uh, uh, rather, they do not produce their own food. So they depend on other animals or plants. And in the region around them, the food is exhaustible. So, so once you finish the food in one point, you may have to move to another point to get more food. So the primary purpose of Animals to locomote is to find food or to fend themselves from other creatures that may want to eat them. And what enables them to do so is uh, what we call as a brain and a nervous system. So I'll introduce you to this little slightly complicated uh, principle that underlies most of cognitive function. So, so this uh, has been made famous by Professor Carl Freston, who has been called the father of modern neuroscience. So, so let's start uh, from the beginning. So imagine something has to exist in this world. So rather not exist at a point in time, but exist over time. So, so that means you have, uh, so let me remind you of something called the second law of thermodynamics. So the second law of thermodynamics states that uh, with time, disorder in the world keeps increasing endlessly. So if something has to exist, so it has to constantly fight against this, disorder that is pulling you apart from uh, in all, all different kinds of directions. 
so don't get carried away by the complex maths that is given here so i mean so let's uh, let's look at this uh, a simple thought experiment so imagine that you drop uh, put a drop of ink uh, into a jar of water uh, so as you can see in the the pic uh, picture below so normally when you drop or put a drop of ink the ink rapidly diffuses because there are dissipative forces pulling it in various directions so so diffusion of the ink droplets happen then it moves in all possible directions and this is what happens to most biological entities so including our bodies so if we were left without any forces acting on it or then you will find that we get dissipated in our environment so that is how we die but the purpose of being alive is to constantly fight the environment that tries to kill us and how do we do that is now let's imagine that uh, this ink doesn't move doesn't get dissipated but it forms a particular blob as we can see here and willfully moves from one point to the other so how do you think that would be possible so, so i would guess that uh, the ink droplet has to constantly figure out which direction the forces are acting on it so it has to imagine that it has to be able to perceive the environment around it and it has to perceive that the ink droplet is getting pulled in different directions and also it needs a motor phenomenon so it needs to produce forces that act against e phenomenon so that needs to exist over time has to have some measure of how to perceive the world to figure out what are the forces that act on it and also it needs to act against the forces that try to dissipate it so that is the basic principle of how organisms exist uh, this is true for both plants and animals plants do it in a different way animals do it in a different way and animals need have a brain but plants do not so let's look at another interesting concept so if there are more questions on this we can always come back to this but this is a basic concept of why we need to have a brain and why uh, in order to survive so here is another in uh, ancient theory uh, by another uh, german biologist called jacob von uexkel so he said that the entire nervous system consists of only two things it's called as the perception and action cycle so, so as i told you that you need to perceive the world around you so that you know what are the forces that are trying to dissipate you and also you have needs to survive in the world so you have energy needs you have personal needs so you're looking at uh, forces you need energy to sustain yourself so because of these you need to perceive what is around you and how do you act so you need to act in this world to prevent or get away from these forces or to act on these forces so that you can get energy so if that sounds all theoretical so let's look at the life cycle of a tick Uh, so just jacob von uxl actually looked at tick and he found that the life cycle of the tick uh, consists of a larval stage it walks around uh, but instead of looking at it in a complicated way he just looked at it as uh, from the tick's point of view uh, there are only three kinds of uh, things it can perceive so if the tick the adult tick knows that uh, if there is a grass it would like to climb on top of it so that it can be exposed and it and once it goes there it keeps waiting and the next thing it knows in the world is the smell of butyric acid so whether you are a dog whether you are a cow or whether you are a professor of neurology all smell of the same butyric acid so to the tick all mammals which smell the same and all form a very similar entity so it can't differentiate between one mammal and the other and so once it gets the smell of butyric acid it just jumps onto them and then it goes and finds a warm so it moves towards the hairless part and then starts sucking blood and so from a tick's point of view you will see that uh, it is able to perceive butyric acid it's able to perceive warm bodies and it is able to perceive an area which is and what does it do it either moves towards it and then starts sucking blood so you can see that there is a perception component to the tick's life and there is an action component to the tick's life so that is how it acts so now so if you see that the entire life uh, the internal life of an organism is called as a umwelt and it consists of two things is a perception part and an action part and this is what uh, ux kel actually explained and now if you kind of complicate it with billions of years of evolution and you will end up with this complicated human brain which even though looks so complicated here from a conceptual point of view can be completely easily divided into the front of the brain and the back of the brain so what is denoted in blue is the back of the brain and what divides it is the central sulcus so as a rule of thumb we say that everything behind the central sulcus is the perceptual part of the brain 
and everything anterior to the central sulcus is the action part of the brain and together these two along with the sense organs and the effector organs form help the brain to have, have the perception action cycle so now let, let's put all of this thing together so if you have to exist as an organism you constantly have to fight the forces that try to dissipate you and in order to do that and if you are an animal you need to move from place to place in order to do that you need to have a perception component and an action component so the sensory organs along with the posterior part of the brain helps in perception and the anterior part of the brain or the motor component helps in action and if you can see that uh, the with the environment there are various so you can see that the primary sensory areas are very close to the central sulcus the associative areas are slightly away and the associative heteromodal association cortex are even further so, so and all of these are connected to each other at multiple levels this is how the brain functions so there's a perceptual component and an action component and if you see the brain uh, there are the various parts of the brain are connected so you can uh, one of the mathematical ways of looking at uh, networks is something called as a node and edge model uh, so i would not like to uh, you to pay too much attention to this because there's an easier way of looking at it from a clinical point of view uh, you can see this as neural networks as one to one connections one to many connections many to one and many to many connections so let's assume that uh, because we are going to be talking about cognitive impairment and neurological impairment let's assume that there is uh, damage to this pink node over here and you will find that everything downstream to this will be affected so classical example is the corticospinal tract or optic nerve where there is just a serial connection where this one to one connection so if you have damage to one point everything below below that will have damage so if you damage one point in the internal capsule or the motor cortex you will have weakness all around below that now if you have one to many connections it's a divergent kind of network so classical example is the brain stem reticular activating system so if you have a damage wide areas of the brain can be affected so all you need is a metabolic disturbance or a structural lesion in the brain stem because it's a one to many connection entire global cerebral dysfunction can happen so then you can have many to one connection like a large area of the brain can converge to close to one area so classical example even though it's is the corticospinal tract where uh, the internal capsule many fibers come together so a lesion at one point like say in the blue node here can cause weakness of both upper and lower limb fibers because all of them come together at one point and coming to many to many connections so so these are all multiple parallel connections so you can see that even if you knock off many nodes here there'll be still connection between two points so you will find that certain areas like the parietal lobe the temporal lobe and the frontal lobe you can have large lesions but they may not have any deficits because of the many to many parallel connections in the brain so this is a simple way to understand how neural networks function so with this knowledge we are ready to actually tackle uh, two main cognitive functions so there are two brain functions one is called as the state function and the other is called as channel function so state function is nothing but one to many divergent connections starting from the brain stem and it projects to bilateral cortices so you need an intact brain stem you need normal metabolic processes like a normal oxygen saturation normal sodium level normal resting membrane potential normal ph all of this projects to bilateral cerebral cortices and uh, makes the brain receptive for sensory phenomena and this is called as a state function on channel function on the other hand are one to one connections in the brain so these are like language function memory where Uh, one part of the brain is connected to the other part of the brain performing one particular function for example the broca's area and the wernicke's area are connected and that is a channel function so the most important concept in this lecture is that you need to know that state functions depend on rather channel functions depend on state function so in order for channel functions to function you should have a, a well intact state function so if you are already drowsy or unconscious you cannot really comment whether the patient has got aphasia or a dementia or underlying problem so so to make this conceptually easy so i'd like to call this the umbrella model of cognition so you can imagine that the brain uh, is equal into the canopy of the umbrella and the handle of the umbrella along with the opening mechanism uh, is uh, is the brain stem uh, so in order to see if there is any hole in the canopy of the umbrella you should be able to open it so without opening you may not be able to uh, say whether there is many holes in the canopy or not 
So as I told you, the state function uh, is tested by the is as, uh, is a function of the brainstem. Uh, there are mainly the monoaminergics, uh, starting from norepinephrine. There is uh, fihydroxytryptamine. There is histamine and GABAergics and uh, cholinergics, all projecting to the various parts of the cortex bilaterally and diffusely. And these are the ones that are contributing, which is called as a state function. And channel functions are language, memory, executive function, all of which uh, depend on state function. So, uh, so this is a basic theoretical concept. So based on this, we need to assess somebody's state function. The state, of, state function consists of arousal and awareness. If the patient is not sleeping, he's got open eyes, he's responding to the stimulus, and he's attentive to whatever you're saying, that means his state function is good. And only if state function is normal, then you can assess the other channel function, which is language, memory, perception, and other things like emotions. And so it's possible that you may have dysfunction in language and memory and perception when the state function is abnormal. So, so you should not make a false diagnosis of things like language dysfunction and memory. So classic example is a delirium. So, later. So there are some common uh, screening tools that we use. So you must be already aware of that and this test. So, so what this doesn't test is the state function. So you should be before commenting on any of these scores, MMSE or MOCA, you should make sure that the patient is arousable and is able to at least come, you are able to communicate with the patient. You're able to, and they're able to sustain their attention. So if they're not able to do this, you will find that uh, you will get grossly abnormal scores in this and you will not be able to interpret it accurately. So, uh, so coming to cognitive function, uh, before we go on to that, I'd like to comment on two things. Uh, we'll go back to the umbrella model. So state function, then channel function, there. a general approach to cognitive function is that first assess state function. So patient has to be awake and aware and arousable. And then you can really say that his state function is normal or not. So if you have an uh, acute onset state function dysfunction, then it's called as a delirium or there's a structural lesion in the brain. Stem. So you find that patient is drowsy or hyper arousable and he's uh, very restless or sleepy. Then you say that the state function is abnormal. The commonest cause for that is a metabolic encephalopathy. Uh, it may be an infection like sepsis. It may be a hyponatremia or always look for a structural lesion. So to, when will you suspect a structural lesion affecting state function? Look for pupils, look for eye movements, look for hemiparesis. So in a patient who is not arousable, who's got focal neurological deficits, localizing to the brain stem, mainly which is either uh, abnormal eye signs or who's got a hemiparesis or ataxia, then you would think of a state function problem because of a brain stem lesion. So if you get a, a confused patient who is not arousable, who has no focal neurological deficits, you will think of a metabolic encephalopathy or a delirium in this setting. So approach to channel function is that in a patient who is awake and arousable, if you find that they have insidious onset gradual progression of focal neurological deficits localizing to the cortex, which is either language dysfunction, memory impairment, impairment in executive function, or behavioral disturbance, then you will think of a dementia syndrome. And we need to consider a dementia and this insidious onset gradually progressive symptoms of memory plus another domain over a period of six months. So to summarize, if you have an acute onset state function dysfunction, then you think of a delirium. Insidious onset, gradually progressive channel function dysfunction with normal state function, then you will think of a dementia syndrome. So having said this, uh, we'll go on to how we assess uh, bedside cognitive function. So first we check arousal and awareness. That means uh, if the patient is awake and sitting up and cooperative, then you the patient who is drowsy, you may want to see if they're arousable see if they're able to communicate. Uh, so the first thing that we do once we know that the patient is arousable is to check their attention. So the bedside way of checking attention is to do the digit forward and a digit uh, backward. And this is called as a digit span. So the digits are said at one per second. So we normally write it down. So we have a written format like this and then we show. And the patient is, uh, and it's supposed to be one, uh, one number per second. And the person is supposed to repeat it back. So normal digit forward span ranges between five to seven. And it varies with age and educational status. And it also depends on the motivation of the patient to do it. And digit backward on the other hand is a little more difficult. So people who are more educated, people who are more uh, comfortable with numbers and 
especially in the field of maths and science, are more likely to have a higher digit backward span. And people who are not educated or illiterate, who may not be able to do this, just uh, does not mean that they have any disease, but it may be a normal phenomenon. So it's better not to overcall digit backward, but it also looks at the ability of patient, the person to manipulate mental information. So the other thing that we also check along with attention is orientation. So you're able to, if they're able to say where they're located in, in, in space and what the time is, is also important. So after attention, we also want to know whether the person is able to sustain their attention. This is an important test to do because if you're not able to do, if they're not able to perform well on this, that means the long cognitive, uh, cognitive testing takes a long time and it takes a lot of motivation and effort from the patient. So if they're not able to maintain their attention over even a period of one minute, then you'll find that all the tests will come abnormal. So, so vigilance test is what we do is called as a random letter test. We say we read out all these alphabets that is shown here in sequence and the person is supposed to tap on the bench or on that on their uh, lap whenever they see whenever you read out an alphabet a and you will find that uh, if it's the few errors of uh, omission are okay if more than three errors of omission or any error of commission that means the person's vigilance is not good and what if vigilance is impaired it also means that not only attention but Reliability of all the subsequent tests uh, need to be questioned. So in order to communicate with the patient and do other tests, the next most important thing in channel function is language. Uh, so the simple thing is to ask the patient an open-ended question and ask why they're there in the hospital so that you, you'll know whether you're able to communicate with the patient, whether you're able to do uh, and spontaneous speech. So once you assess spontaneous speech, you find that there's something abnormal, then you want to do three things, three things that we check is one is comprehension, repetition and fluency. So comprehension tests the functioning of the Wernicke's area or the, uh, the perceptive areas of the brain, which is located in the posterior part of the brain and repetition and uh, uh, fluency assesses the Broca's area. Repetition checks the uh, connectivity of the white matter tracts between the Broca's and the Wernicke's area, which is also called as the arcuate fasciculus. So comprehension we do by two methods. One is called uh, one is by pointing commands. So you usually ask the person to point to common objects. Uh, it's you should avoid pointing to uh, like body uh, body parts, midline structures, and to overcome neglect and field defects, you always ask them to point to objects on either side of the field, so that you are able to see whether they are able to point to commands. And if they have weakness, you can always ask them to look towards an object also, so that you are. The main idea is to understand, see whether they're able to comprehend whatever you're trying to communicate. With. Also, you can ask yes, no questions. These questions have to be objective questions that the, and the patient should be having, that information should be available. So when a patient was admitted in the ICU, is it raining today may not be relevant, but you can ask questions like, is the light on? Are you in hospital? So, or is your name so and so? So these are questions that will tell you whether the patient is able to comprehend or not. Repetition tells you whether the arcuate fasciculus is intact or not. So if the repetition is intact, then we're dealing with a person with transcortical aphasia. If repetition is impaired, that means we're dealing with a perisylvan aphasia. That means the primary language areas are involved. So we start with a single word and longer words and a sequence of uh, words. So the number of words a person can repeat is usually about one more than the digit span of the person. So that is the normative value for that. So naming actually depends on the anterior temporal lobe, its connection to the language areas and its distribution to wide parts of the brain. So it's got limited localization value, but you can get selective naming problems. So we ask people to name objects, body parts, uh, parts of objects and colors. Coming to fluency. So fluency, an easy way to understand fluency is by the number of uh, words a person can speak when you, when you assess their spontaneous speech. Uh, so the two formal ways of testing it is uh, one is called the category fluency test. Where we ask them to name animals and if they're not familiar with animals, you can ask them to name vegetables or any other category that they're familiar with. So this is not only a test of language, it is also a front so depend on working memory and your memory st searching strategies. So you would ask, and it's also a time test. So you ask the person to uh, name as many animals as possible over a period of one minute and a normal person if they don't have do not have bradykinesia or bradyphrenia will name about 10 to 12 animals 
in a, in one minute. In the phonemic fluency test, uh, you ask the person to say. Uh, in English, you ask them to say F A S, or in the Indian languages, we ask them to say Ka Pa Ma. The number of words that they are able to say with this. So this also is a test of fluency. So unless the person is very educated, uh, a lot of our uh, patients uh, find this test a little difficult to do. So if they are literate, you would want to assess their reading. So reading, you would give them. Uh, sing so you want to know whether they are able to read single uh, single alphabets, whether they are able to read words. They're able to read out a sentence aloud, and they're if they're able to read a small story, and they're able to tell you the gist. So that is reading to comprehension. So similarly, writing, you want them to write a single alphabet. Are they able to write a word to command? And if they are able to write a spontaneous sentence or a writing to command, and they're able to follow such a command through. So reading and writing also needs to be assessed. So that's about language. So memory is a function that is tested next because if you're not able to remember the, remember the command, then you can't perform all the other higher problems. So memory can be classified as immediate or recent memory and remote memory. Immediate memory is also called as working memory and that is tested by the digit span. It's also called as attention. So, so in order to comment on recent memory, your immediate memory has to be good. So recent memory depends on the the hippocampal networks uh, for functioning. So there are two components to it. Uh, one is the visual memory and the other is the verbal memory. So for visual memory, we give three to five words and ask them to recall, or you can give a paired uh, set of words and ask them to remember. So if they're not able to improve, remember, you can give one of the words as a cue and see whether they're able to remember. And for visual memory, you can hide three or five common objects in and around the bedside and ask, see if they're able to recollect. If not, you can show uh, about three to five pictures and later show them a set of multiple pictures and see whether if they're able to identify what was shown to them. So remote memory on the other hand is uh, semantic memory as well as episodic memory. You can ask them historical facts and you can ask them some uh, personal information and see if they remember. So we looked at the three main domains and we looked at attention, we looked at language and memory. Now we are able to uh, look at other cognitive functions. So uh, you want to look at constant ability depends on normal sensory and motor functions. Also, it means that uh, you should be able to perceive objects that are shown to you and you should have no motor dysfunction. So only then you can see whether the person has got constructional impairment or not. In that case, you would call it constructional apraxia. So the commonest thing that we do at the bedside is asking them to draw a star like in hepatic encephalopathy. Uh, you can use little more complex pictures uh, depending on underlying diagnosis. And this is a function of the right parietal lobe. The other thing that you would test in the right parietal lobe is ask history of dressing apraxia. So you can also give a person a t-shirt or a kurta and see if they're able to align the long body of the kurta to the long body of the, the uh, long axis of the person and you see if they're able to wear in the right way. So this is also a right parietal function. So uh, you also can ask them to draw to command. You can ask them to draw a flower pot. You can ask them to draw a house. And clock drawing is a complex function. It's not just restricted to construction. So you need to plan how to draw a clock. You need to draw a circle. Then you may have to draw the numbers. So firstly, you have to be educated. You should have drawn this before. So it's not only a parietal function, but it's also an executive uh, function. So calculations are uh, supposed to be a function of the dominant parietal lobe, which is the left parietal lobe. So you can ask, if they're not well-versed with mathematics, you can ask them simple addition. They're more educated and they're more comfortable with maths. You may be able to give them more written. And this again is a function of whether people are comfortable with numbers and dealing with maths. So if people perform badly on this, does it not necessarily mean that they have an underlying cognitive dysfunction. Coming to praxis, praxis is the ability to perform learned motor acts. So in order to assess learned motor acts, you should have no motor weakness, no sensory weakness, no obvious cerebellar signs. You should have reasonably good uh, perceptual ability. So you should know where the object is and you should know the function of the objects. So when you have normal power, normal sensation, and you should have learned the particular act. Like for example, if I want to you know, brush my teeth, so I should know that uh, I, I, may, I should be able to identify the toothbrush. I should be able to hold on to it. But the way I hold on to it and the way I try to brush will determine whether my praxis networks are functioning or not. So the way we check praxis, which is a left parietal function, is to 
see whether the person is able to comb their head. So you can ask them to show action, or if they're able to brush their teeth, comb their hair, or use a scissors. If they're not able to do this, you can give them the real object and see whether they're able to. So intransitive actions, we use gestures, gestures like waving goodbye, saying namaste. So you can use, uh, also you can look at for particular uh, things like blowing out a matchstick or taking the position of a dancer or a boxer or kicking a football. So all of these can be used to check uh, transitive and intransitive action that involve the whole body. So just gestural knowledge like, uh, like common gestures uh, can is again coded by the left parietal lobe. So you can ask people to uh, imitate gestures. This tells you that uh, the connection between the occipital lobe uh, to the praxis networks in the parietal lobe is intact. So you can give them a verbal command and ask them to uh, uh, imitate the, follow the gesture. And that will tell you that the connection between the auditory cortex, the language areas to the praxis network is intact. So you can find that sometimes there may be a dis dissociation between imitation and, uh, and uh, verbal command. And that is called as a dissociation kind of apraxia. Uh, sequential action, like following a three-step command, used to be called as ideational apraxia. It's actually not a apraxic syndrome, but it's actually more of a frontal lobe dysfunction and an executive dysfunction. So uh, conceptual knowledge and uh, concept of tools is also held in the parietal lobe. So sometimes you may find that if you have a parietal lobe lesion, uh, you will not know the particular function of the tool. So like say, for example, the hammer is uh, for striking a nail screwdriver is for twisting over a screw. So this conceptual knowledge is lost. That tells you that the person is likely to have a parietal lobe dysfunction. A person who is not able to perform but who knows the concept tells you that the lesion for the apraxia is outside the parietal lobe. And if they are failing at any of these, you should always try to use a real object. So this is a common uh, picture that uh, we show. So we show them various tools and we ask them what is the function and how they use all of these. It also assesses visual perception. They're able to identify these objects, especially some overlapping objects like the scissor and the comb. So that tells you the perception is all right. Then we ask them the concept of what is, which one used for. We ask them to show the action which actually tests the praxis. So, so we also, as a part of the parietal lobe function, we also check right and left orientation. So we ask them to point uh, various, uh, the right side and the left side. Uh, if, uh, if you're still thinking of a parietal lobe dysfunction and the person is normal, then you ask them to show it crossed on the person and sometimes crossed on the examiner as mentioned in this slide. So there's a, uh, another syndrome in the dominant parietal lobe called the adjustment syndrome where you have acalculia, agraphia and finger agnosia. So as part of that, we also try to uh, ask the person to identify the fingers on themselves as well as on the other person. And if you have a problem with that, then the problem is likely to be in the angular gyrus in the dominant hemisphere. So the parietal lobe, so you also check two-point discrimination, graphesthesia, and stereognosis. Uh, this is quite important in syndromes like the corticobasal syndrome, where, which predominantly involves the sensory cortex. So geographical uh, orientation or topographical disorientation, which is the pathology of that, is uh, basically that you will find that uh, for people who get uh, disoriented and lost in space. So this may be uh, like finding, going to a shop and getting lost, uh, or it could be like uh, within the house while going to the bathroom, they think that some other area is a bathroom. So, so this would mean that you want to find out uh, whether they really have an aim or a destination. So, so patient may be having a wandering behavior, like people with frontal lobe dysfunction, they may not have any intention, but they just randomly wander around and they're not very distressed by it. And uh, when you find them, they are not very distressed or upset. Uh, people with uh, hippocampal dysfunction or medial temporal lobe dysfunction, uh, they want to go home, but they can't find the way. They can't recognize landmarks, so they're distressed. So they have an intention to return and they're very much, and they have, uh, so, so that is what we find in temporal lobe dysfunction. So occasionally you can have epileptic phenomena, you can have uh, epileptic amnesia where the person uh, temporarily lo loses awareness and uh, but they don't know that what has ha really happened. Uh, this can happen both in uh, epileptic amnesia as well as transient global amnesia. So while checking geographical orientation, you can ask the person whether where they are in the hospital, whether they, will they be able to find out where the toilet is, they're able to point out in the hospital and whether they're able to, if you can show them a common map of India or, or whichever country they're in, and you can actually ask them to show which stay, uh, where their city is. A simple way to 
assess the geographical disorientation is to kind of uh, ask them to draw a small uh, position in the house and point, point out where they are uh, they are ex exactly another thing for parietal lobe function is something called as neglect you will find that patient is not able to pay attention to stimuli on one side of the visual field or all modalities. So easy bedside way is to actually give a line cancellation test where you draw lines on either side of the field and you ask the person to cross them out. You can also do a line bisection. So you can find that uh, you give a long uh, a, a line at least 15 centimeters long and you ask them to uh, bisect it in the middle and you will find that people with neglect are not able to do this. Coming to visual perception, so to assess visual perception, first we show them simple objects like lights at home. Once you know that they are able to recognize common objects, that means they do not have a visual agnosia. If you find that the person is, you show them a picture of an apple or a banana and they are not able to recognize it, uh, but the moment you give it in the hand, they are able to feel it and they are able to recognize it, then you would suspect of visual agnosia. So agnosia is nothing but inability to recognize an object through one modality, but you're able to recognize it through another modality and you're able to name it. So while testing visual perception, first thing you want to rule out is whether they're able, they're able to recognize common objects. And if they're not able to recognize, are they able to match? So if they're able to not recognize, but they're able to match, then you will think of an associative agnosia. So if they're not able to recognize and they're not able to match, then you'll think of an aperceptive kind of agnosia. So once they're able to recognize single objects, you want to know whether they're able to see a complex visual scene because uh, visual attention is quite complicated. You need to see multiple objects over a short period of time and <clears throat> not overlap one over the other. So the cookie thief is, uh, picture is one thing that we commonly give. Uh, but however, in the Indian context, we find that a lot of uh, our patients actually get quite confused to what's happening. So we have an Indian village scene, which is adapted to the Indian context. So, and the person is asked to describe what they're seeing in this scene. So people who are not entire full picture and able to see only parts of it, uh, it could be that it may be because of neglect or it could be because of a field defect. And once you rule out these two, then it may be because of something called as simultaneous where you're not able to see multiple objects simultaneously. So this is due to dysfunction in the bilateral parieto-occipital parieto -occipital junction, which is also called as a balance syndrome. Patients with balance syndrome also have another condition, two other things called as optic ataxia and oculomotor apraxia. So optic ataxia is inability to uh, reach, uh, reach out to an object in space. And oculomotor apraxia is, uh, you, they will not be able to follow voluntary uh, commands to look to one particular side. So going on to visual perception, we also try to uh, ask them to recognize faces. So they can, we ask them to show to recognize faces from non-face objects. And we also, there's something called as a famous faces test where we, uh, this is a culturally modified famous faces uh, test. We show people to, and ask them if they can recognize all of these personalities. And uh, another aspect of uh, facial perception is, are they able to identify facial uh, emotions? Uh, this is also a test of social cognition. Uh, as to identify whether they're able to recognize the emotions of the of the people shown here. So coming to higher uh, mental function, which is actually executive executive function. Uh, executive function is uh, all the cognitive components that constitute goal-directed behavior. So if you take goal-directed behavior, there has to be an intention and a motivation. Uh, and uh, you need to have a goal. The goal needs to be broken down into multiple sub-goals, which is called as a set. So you need to start with one set and sequence all of these sets. And as you reach the goal, you need to shift from one set to the other. And to make sure that there is no error in between, you need to monitor these errors. And once it's completed, you need to stop. So that the entire process is called as executive function. This involves both memory, it needs uh, attention, it needs vigilance. Uh, and depending on the task, it may need praxis as well. <clears throat> so that is why you do frontal assessment only after all the testing of all the other things. A simple way to do that is to do alternate sequences. So alternate sequences can be a, a grapheme task where you ask them to draw alternate sequences. So people who have inability to shift from one set to the other will have what is called as perseveration. They'll keep drawing the same, uh, same pattern again and again, and they will not be able to shift. Uh, 
Similarly, we can ask them to do alternate hand sequences, which is called the palm fist ring test and sequences. So the other thing, important aspect of uh, executive function is the ability to stop when you reach the goal or when the rule changes, you should be able to stop, especially when the rule uh, consists of uh, complicated uh, sequential tasks. So we do something called as a go no go task where there are various ways of doing it. The simplest way is to ask the person to tap on the lap or on the desk. So if you, sh you should tell them that if you tap once, the person should tap twice. And if you tap twice, the person should not tap at all. And you will find that patients who have uh, ability, inability to uh, inhibit their responses will continue to tap even when you're telling them the, the cue is for not to tap. So another important executive function is uh, perceptual component of executive function is the ability to perceive similarities. So similarities and differences are something that can be tested, but uh, you will find that uh, it's easy for uh, patients to say differences, but uh, what we're looking at is actually not differences, but similarities. Similarities is to identify the common group from which these categories are formed. Like say, for example, we show them uh, like a chair and a table. You ask patients, they'll be very happy to tell you the differences between chair and table. But what we want to know is what is a common category from there? they're coming from. So for example, both are furniture. So answers like uh, both have four, le uh, four legs is not an acceptable answer. So, so the ability to form concepts tells you that you're able to see similarities in differing objects. And that is one of the higher cognitive functions. The other thing that we do is judgment, insight, and proverb interpretation. So proverbs and our metaphors. And so th the answer should not be literally taken. And if they're able to understand the metaphorical meaning of proverbs that tells you that they have a higher, higher level of understanding, which is also called as metacognition. So judgment is, we give a common example of, uh, suppose uh, there's a fire in this place, so what would you do? So if they're able to understand the situation and respond in an appropriate way, then that tells you that their judgment is all right. Insight is the ability to see their current status, both physical as well as cognitive. If they're able to understand that they, their deficits are there, that tells you that, again, the cognitive functions are present. So insight may be absent in some uh, people with amnesia. Or so it may also it may be absent in certain forms of cortical agnosias and cortical blindness as well. And uh, this may also lead to some uh, issues such as confabulation where uh, yeah. one aspect that uh, we don't, don't commonly test, which is often impaired in social cognition. Uh, two things that we need to know is one is the, the most important thing is theory of mind. Uh, so theory of mind is to predict what the other person is thinking. So there are some bedside tests for that as well. And the other common uh, thing that can be tested is the mind uh, mind's eye test, where you look, you show them a picture of a person looking somewhere and then try to infer why they're looking there and what their intentions are. So, so these are not so commonly used, but it's something that's uh, coming up. Okay, so this is my last slide. So I'm open for some questions if there are any. Thank you. Has anyone got any questions? Uh, sir, actually in a busy OPD, is there anywhere uh, we can do these tests uh, simplified form? Yeah, so the most important thing in cognition testing is not any of these testing, but only history. So just simplest thing that you could do is just listen to the patient's uh, history. And uh, arousal and awareness is something that's very easy to test. If the patient is sitting there and talking to you, then you know that they don't really have any state function dysfunction. And the rest of channel function is just the history that the patient is telling you. So, so these are things that you don't really need to do in the OPD, it's something that's a uh, so just the history would suffice from the OPD point of view. So are there any uh, lobe function tests that will take that? Yeah. Uh, overall, this is overall, but yeah. So these see. are, whatever we discussed, uh, the lobe function is a very old concept. So the current concept is that a lot of brain functions are interdependent on each other. So there's, there's not, nothing that uh, is a completely separate lobe function. But of course, there are some localizing values. Like say, for example, episodic memory is a temporal lobe function. Like language is a lateral temporal lobe function and praxis is a dominant parietal lobe function and frontal uh, executive function is both a uh, prefrontal and a parietal lobe function. So, okay. 
there any questions please uh, share in the chat box any questions there? If there are no questions, we'll wind up for today. Thank you, everybody, for listening patiently. And thank you very much, sir, for coming and doing this lecture. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you all for joining.